Okay, I want to back up just a little bit and uh, uh, let's get started with prayer. Hi, Joe. <clears throat> so, Father, we just give you praise and honor and glory for tonight. Lord, I just thank you for everyone that's on this call, for everyone that's going to receive this word, and for everyone that's going to receive it in the future, that it's going to make a difference and change their lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Okay. Okay. So you know, I would like to give you some historical facts. Where did something come from? Where is the root? Where did the root of the words original sin come from? So the root of all of that came from St. Augustine. So let me give you some history on that <clears throat> and then explain what original sin is. He was born in 354 to 430. He was born in Tagast, North Africa. His mother was a Catholic and his father was a pagan. Um, <clears throat> uh, he was very, very, very studied in philosophy. He had a major, major uh, sex addiction uh, from the time he was a young boy. So for him, uh, a couple of these famous prayers came from him. Um, he, this is one of the things that he prayed, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. You get that? Um, another prayer that he uh, prayed was, um, Hold on, I have it wrote down somewhere. I'll get to it. Okay, so um, many who admire him uh, quote us, have their prayer, the prayer of St. Augustine in their homes. He was hypersexual. He kept a mistress for years. He fathered a child out of wedlock with, um, in adultery. He installed numerous laws. Um, he became the, served as Bishop of Hippo, for 35 years, he wrote five books. He is absolutely an idol and spiritually worshipped in the Catholic denomination. Um, all of St. Augustine's laws and um, ordinances were signed at the Council of Carthage at Snod of Orange, which you can look all of that up. Um, I'll get into what... Uh, the original, what he defines original sin as, he installed numerous laws, vows, vows of poverty. That, so that's where that comes from. <clears throat> vows of chastity, vows of obedience, or severe punishment comes. He began and promoted and what um, and uh, persecuted what is now widely taught and perpetrated what is widely taught now in almost every denomination, okay? It's called original sin. And what the definition of that is, it's the condition or the state of sin in to which each human being is born into as a lower, as a desire of lower appetite, contrary to reasoning and righteousness. So in other words, even if an, a baby is born innocently between two spirit-filled Holy Ghost parents raised in a godly home, that child still has uh, the sin of lust and wretchedness in them. So that's where the wording of original sin comes from that were all just completely wicked. That's that he started that whole thing. It took him years and years to years to master his hypersexuality, uh, homosexuality, adultery, the whole thing. He was into the whole thing. He frequented, um, you know, uh, pro prostitutes, all of that. So that in order to overcome all of that and he did overcome it all <clears throat> in over order to overcome all of that he felt like he needed to indoctrinate every human being that they were born into that same thing 
So there's a lot on the internet about him. He is a Catholic saint now. He's reached sainthood, et cetera, et cetera. So I always like to give you something about where something got started. Where did the doctrine of rapture start from? Where did the doctrine of original sin start from? Where did the doctrine of chastity start from? Where did the vow of poverty come from? Where, why can, why do the cardinals and the priests and the popes and a lot of mega pastors have all of this wealth, but the congregation is very poor? Where did all that? So as congregants, we're supposed to take the vow of uh, poverty and chastity, et cetera, et cetera. But they can have wealth because they're up here. It's a caste society. They're up here. And the congregation is to serve them like servants. That's where that whole thing came from. So does that kind of make sense to you? Give me a thumbs up if you understand that. Okay. So I'm put, that's the only thing I've wrote in my notebook. And then my, my, I went cattywampus. So if you are want to follow along with me, or you just want to listen tonight, that's fine too. And <clears throat> we're going to study out, I have some bookends to share with you. Um, we're going to study out some things in the book of Ruth. So, okay, I'm going to explain the book of Ruth to you, and then we're going to pick it up in chapter three. There's only four chapters in the entire book. It's a very short book, but I want to show you some bookends in the book of Ruth that literally I didn't read a lot this, this week because I just wanted to rest my eye, and honestly, I had hot packs on my eye most of the week. But I was sitting at the kitchen table and it just came like a download. And I go, Martin, you've got to hear what God's downloading to me. So what was downloaded to me, just woof, uh, downward causation. It's a, it's so, it's amazing. I want to give it to you. Do I have it all written out? No. And I think that this is going to be unfolding in me as much as it will be for you. So if God gives you things this week, put it into the WhatsApp about all of this. Okay. So let's, let's go to the book of Ruth. So in the book of Ruth is called courageous love. And it's really the story of a mother-in-law and two daughter-in-laws. Okay, so the husband dies, um, and then the two sons die. So Naomi's <clears throat> husband dies, and then her two sons die, leaving the three women alone. So that's basically chapter one. But when you think about their names, it's very powerful. Uh, he comes from the house of Emelech, which means my God is king. That's that's the uh, husband. Naomi means pleasant, gracious, sweet, agreeable, delightful, unsurpassed beauty. Um, one of the sons' name is Mayon, Melon, and it means ill, sickly, worn out, and afflicted or wounded. Ruth was married to him. And his name absolutely represents the law, capital L, Old Old Testament law, okay? One of her son's name is Chilon, and it means destruction or, or um, consumption, and that's what the law does. So one of the daughters-in-law's name was Orphra, and she was the one that fled and went back to her people, Okay. Ruth stayed with Naomi. It the the hominin in um Hebrew means to fawn um or it means uh it sounds exactly in Hebrew like the word rebellious. So she went back to the Moabite. She went back to Moab to her people. So that's um and the name Ruth means uh neighbor, shepherdess, beautiful, delightful pleasing, satisfied, um, and refreshing. So that kind of gives you an overview, a little bit of chapter one, but I want to 
the word where it says that Ruth clung to Naomi, that in the Hebrew literally means to make a covenant with someone. When in the Old Testament, when it says that they clung to it, it means that they it was a, a covenant that she was not going to break her covenant with her mother-in-law. She was going with her mother-in-law. So Ruth went with Naomi. And then she says to her, listen, this is very important. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. And your people will now be my people and your God will now be my God. Now, Ruth was a Moabite out of the town of, of the clan of uh, Moab. So she came from that. So what she said to Ruth was very significant because they were heading back to Bethlehem where only one God was served. Yahweh. So Ruth let go of all of her people, all of those Moabite gods, all of their customs, everything. And she clung. So that statement right there is, I am dying to myself. In Hebrew, it means I am dying to myself and I am now taking on the identity of your God. That is a picture of Jesus Christ. We die to ourselves and we take on the Lord Jesus Christ right there. So Naomi returns to Bethlehem with Ruth and they travel uh, together from Moab, the place of false gods. So we're going to pick it up. Um, they meet Boaz in chapter two. So we're going to pick it up in ch chapter three. Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, I want you, I want to see you marry so you'll be happy and secure. Now, listen, a man named Boaz is our relative. So let me explain that to you. When there were no living sons, that's why they tried to have sons. When there were no living sons, the next living relative had to marry that the, the woman, okay? Whoever the surviving woman was had to so if it was your brother your and you died your brother needed to marry you that's why there were so many wives it wasn't it was a matter of survival in those days so it, it wasn't adultery and um you know it wasn't it, somebody could have numerous wives in that time it was normal it was normal thinking so boaz was the next relative in line as far as they knew Okay, so I'm trying to make this really, really clear to you and try to teach you some uh, customs at the same time. So it says that Boaz is our nearest relative. You worked with his servant girl to in his field. That happened in chapter two. This evening, he'll be winnowing with barley on the threshing floor. Now, the threshing floor, if you've never seen one, is absolutely amazing the way they winnow the look it up online it's an amazing video to watch um he'll be winnowing on the threshing floor now go take a bath and uh and get yourself dressed in in the passion it says to put on your best clothes but i think that's his translation don't let him know you're there until he's um, had plenty to eat and drink. That word drink right there is not like get drunk. It means to rehydrate after being into the fields. Watch closely to see where he lies down. Now, in those days when they were doing the harvest, it's this way now. Um, my niece is on the call. And when, when they're out there in harvesting time, those guys don't come in. They're out there. I mean, now they have combines, but they're out there 24 seven getting the crops and it's just a constant ongoing process until it's all done. Right. And they then and then just like the shepherds would stay in the fields with the sheep when they were harvesting, the landowners would come and stay in the fields with the harvesters. <clears throat> Now, this is the part that I want to start really teaching you guys. She says, <clears throat> then go and uncover his feet and lie down there, and he will tell you what to do. Now, uncovering the feet, 
is very important in the Hebrew culture. This is why I was trying to tell you weeks ago that anthropology, the customs of those times is very, very, very important when it comes to understanding not just the language and the symbolism of the language and the jot and the tittle and where everything is on the page and they read from right to left and we've switched that and everything is switched around in our English, okay? So you have to understand that uncovering the feet there because when people went to bed, they would wash their feet with uh, water and then put oil all over the feet. So uncovering the feet was her way of telling him, number one, you're safe with me. Number two, um, I want to be your wife. They were not sexually intimate, but it was her way of saying, I want to be yours. It, they don't have um, intimacy or sex, the Bible says, until after they actually marry in chapter four. So this wasn't about her crawling in bed and having sex with him. It was about her honoring him as a man and saying, I know you're the next in line that is supposed to marry me. I want to, I, I want to allow you to do that. So think of it as her way of giving him permission to redeem her and propose to her. You understand? Okay. I know it's a weird custom in, in, um, <laughs> in our world, but there it was very, very, very normal. In fact, if you walked into someone's house, because they wore sandals everywhere. If you walked into someone's house and they did not give you a bowl of water and olive oil for your feet, it was considered absolutely rude. Like you, Like it was, you're not even supposed to be in my house. That's how rude it was. So for her to uncover his feet was a very intimate, sweet thing for her to do. And you'll see he did not take offense to it. Um, that evening, Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did all her mother-in-law told her to do. After that evening meal, Boaz was in a good mood. He went down to lie down at the far end of the grain pile and, file, pile and fell fast asleep. Ruth quietly tiptoed over to him and uncovered his feet and just laid down by him. Around midnight, uh, Boaz was startled awake. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, Boaz says. He said, she says, I am Ruth, your servant girl. She answered and she spread the corner of your, please spread the corner corner of your garment over me because you are my close relative by marriage one who is my kingsman redeemer that is one of jesus's name so i got my tallit out i just wanted to show you what that means it, it he actually mistranslates it in the passion bible um hold on let me let me go to um because it's actually wings Um, your bless. She asks him um, to put the wings of his garment over her. So in Hebrew custom, this is a tallit right here. This is a really big one. This is like the size of a blanket. This is the four corners. And on the four corners is Hebrew prayers. I don't know if you can see that in white, but there is. There's uh, the Hebrew symbols. There's all kinds of Hebrew writing in the fabric, sewn into the fabric. And these are the wings. Okay, these are these tassels. There's four of them. There's four of them. These represent the 613 laws of the Moses laws. Okay, so they wore all of this. This right here, this silk part went over their head. I don't I don't know if you could see any of the design on this, but I'll try to get it close to the camera. There's usually all kinds of Hebrew. So this got evenly placed over their heads like this when they were praying, just like this. So, and then they would hold the tassels and they would pray the prayers holding the tassels, a lot like how the Catholics use rosary beads, okay? This one's straight out of the heart of Israel. Uh, the cardia. 
So when she was asking him to cover her, she was asking him to take the most sacred part of the his talit, his talit, and literally cover her. So the talit in Hebrew is their most sacred garment. It's it's like I will protect you. It's it's the covering. So I want you to hold your fingers there. Now I'm going to show you a couple of bookends here. Turn your keep your finger in Ruth and turn your Bible over to Psalm 91. And it says he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, and God in him I will trust. And it goes on down to verse 3. Uh, he says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and of the perilous pestilence, that's all sickness and disease. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Now, Ruth is King David's great-grandmother. Where do you think he got that from? His great-grandma. So there's a bookend from the book of Ruth all the way to Psalm 91. And that is now... Take your Bible one more time over to, hold on, I should have wrote this down, to Matthew 9.20. So keep your fingers still in Ruth and go over to Matthew 9.20. So... Matthew 9, 20. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did the disciples. And then suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. That is a mistranslation. It says it touched the wings of his garment, the tassels. So there is your thread all the way from the old testament into the psalms and now jesus healed this woman with his delete she touched his delete for she said to herself if only i may touch the garment i shall be made well the woman touched the hem of jesus's garment and the tassels hanging from the edge as a jewish cloak or the tallit to remind the jews of the torah so there's your there's your thread all the way through isn't that amazing give me a thumbs up if you can see that thread that that's very 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 powerful now let me uh keep going i'm gonna go go slow because there's so much in here and he says who are you so then he, she says i am ruth your servant girl we just did all of that um so boaz says dear woman may yahweh bless you for this kindness you are showing me exceeds the kindness that you have shown to naomi you didn't search for a young man to marry either rich or poor my daughter don't worry i promise you to do everything you ask because everyone knows you are a brave woman and of noble character so right there he already knows that he's going to pr propose to her so he tells her to stay the night but not to be seen the next morning he feels uh, a cloak that she had with about 30 to 50 pounds worth of um, seed and food. And then um, she let me go down here. She says, um, as Ruth was about to leave, Boaz said to her, here, bring me your cloak you're wearing and hold it open. And as she held it open, Boaz poured six measures of barley into it. And I could go into all the significance of the barley here, but we, we won't have time. Then he helped 
place it in her head and to carry. And she carried it all the way back to Bethlehem. Now circle that in your Bible because that is really important. The word virtuous woman is where we get from Proverbs 31. This is the Hebrew word chayil, and it is used in connection with military prowess and moral excellence. We can see Ruth as a metaphor for the church, the coming bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. So she, this whole story, even though it's true, is a metaphor. Our Kingsman Redeemer is Jesus Christ. So I'm going to turn over because Naomi asked her how it went and she told him. So then um, listen to what she, Naomi, Naomi answered, my daughter, wait here until you see what happens. Boaz will not rest until it is finished, doing what he promised he would do. So turn your Bibles. I'm going to give you another bookend. Turn your Bibles to John 19.30. You can leave your finger in Ruth. Go over to John 19.30. Pretty sure that's where we're at. Yep. We'll start in verse uh, 28. And after Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. And then the vessel full of sour wine, wine was sitting there, and they filled it with a sponge with sour wine. And they put his up on it, which was a painkiller, by the way. And they put it in his mouth. So Jesus had received the sour wine. And he said what? It is finished. In Greek, that is the word to telestai. In Hebrew, it is the word kala. K-A-L-A. -A. He didn't say to telestai. He didn't speak Greek. He said it, it is kala. Finished. It is finished. It is complete. So just like Ruth uh, Naomi was telling Ruth what Boaz promised he is going to finish the book end to Boaz because he is named the Kingsman Redeemer and Jesus is our Kingsman Redeemer is not verse 1930. It is finished. Okay. All right. Let's just keep going. Okay, um, so now we're into chapter four of Boaz, the Kingsman Redeemer. And here he goes to the outside gate um, of Bethlehem because in those days, in order to be heard in court or to be heard by what is called the court's council, you had to wait at the gate uh, at the outer part of the city, and then they would call you in. Now, Boaz was pretty important, so they saw him right away. They didn't make him wait for a long time. Then they they uh, they invited the men to sit down, and they they heard it. Well, at that time, they found out that there was another male that could have married Ruth. So he starts saying to Boaz, let me just pick it up. Um, Sir, Naomi has returned from the country of Moab, and she is selling a piece of property that belonged to our relative Amalek. Remember, Amalek means God. So I thought I ought that you ought to know about it. Buy it if you want. We can make it official in the presence of these, that's the council, and in the presence of the elders of our people. And the king, and as the Kingsman Redeemer, you have the first right of refusal. So redeem it if you choose to, but if not, tell me and I will know that I am the next in line. So this is Boaz talking to the other man that they thought was before Boaz that should have married Ruth. So look what happened. The man replied, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz added, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite the widow of the dead. Therefore, it will be your responsibility to father a child. This is a picture of Christ here. 
in order to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. At this, the Kingsman Redeemer balked and said, in that case, I am not able to redeem it for myself without risking my own inheritance. So he, the, the first guy backed out. Now, Boaz is going to jump in and take it. Take my purchase option of redemption for yourself, for I cannot do it. And at that time in Israel, in order to finalize a transaction concerning the redeeming and the transfer of property, a man would customarily remove a sandal and give it to the other party, making the contract legally binding. That's where the phrase, uh, walk a mile in my shoes, comes from. That's one of the phrases that comes out of this. So I give you my shoe, you give me your shoe, and I feel I understand what it feels like to walk in your shoes. You got that? So it was a legal contract. We say it as a euphemism now, but that's where that euphemism came from. So when the Kingsman Redeemer said to Boaz, take my purchase option of the redemption yourself, he took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz. Then Boaz returned to the elders and announced publicly, today you are witnesses that I have purchased from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Amalek and all that belong to children and all that belong to Malan. In other words, Boaz is saying this transaction cancels the law. Now I am the Kingsman Redeemer. I own it all. Nobody can take it out of Naomi's hands, Ruth's hands, or my hands. The Trinity. You guys see that? Okay. Um, I will raise children. There's a picture of being uh, children of God. Um, let's see. I will raise children with her who will maintain the dead man's name and in his inheritance. And the name of the dead man may not be cut off from his village or from his family. Today you are witnesses. Then all the elders and the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. That's Old Testament, both whom built up the house. May you become famous in Bethlehem. You need to underline that statement, the house of bread. May you become famous in Bethlehem. So then um, may you become very prosperous. May Yahweh give you children by this young woman and through them. May your family be like family of Perez who... Uh, Tamar uh, bore to Judah. So you need to understand who was David king over Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. So do you see how the book ends all line up out of this little four chapter book? And I've skipped over so much stuff that it's just it's unreal. Like I, if I had hours and hours and hours and hours, I, I couldn't even go into all of it. So Boaz married Ruth and they became one as husband and wife. Yahweh opened Ruth's womb and she bore a son. Then the woman of Bethlehem blessed Naomi. Praise Yahweh who never abandoned you or withheld you from the kingsman redeemer. See, the law holds us back. We've been talking about this now for, uh, this will be, I think, seven or eight weeks about how the law in religion, it holds us back all the time. It keeps us locked in to this cubby of uh, cupboard or box of rules, regulations, methods, traditions, denominations. Our, our, our identity is not in any of that. Our identity is in the Kingsman Redeemer who bought it all back. He bought every bit of it. And so um, uh, down towards the bottom, it says um, the, the first child was named Obed. And Obed is short for, it comes from the name Obadiah, which means um, worshiper or servant of Yahweh. And that's what we become. We become worshipers. We worship, you know, their God on, on this mountain. Think about, then Jesus says, worship me in spirit and in truth. 
So um, at the very end, it kind of gives a little bit of genealogy. Boaz is the father of Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse, and who is the famous King David. And King David is an exact line with Jesus Christ. There's so much when you start unpacking this story. There's so many uh, bookends in the uh, uh, Old Testament to the New Testament. But the whole thing with uh, washing the feet and, you know, in our culture, people look at it, oh, feet are so gross. But in that culture, feet were like super, super, super important. Like the left hand represents the law. The right hand represents power. The feet in that culture represented being honored, being taken care of, being loved on. So turn your Bibles over. Let's start with um, Luke. Let's see. Let's start. Go to Luke 7, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Luke 7. Okay. Um, we're in Luke. This is the story of the woman who, uh, so Jesus had his feet washed twice, twice, one by a woman of the city, which they, and this is mistranslated. There's no proof in any documentation that she was a prostitute. And yet your Bibles probably say she was a prostitute. She was not a woman of the city, or it would be Isha of the city, Isha just means that she could have been married, she could have been divorced, she could have been a widow, she could have been she could have been a lot of things. It, it, it's not the word for a uh, prostitute. So the, they took some liberties in a lot of Bibles with that. You are free to interpret it however you want, but it does not. There's no documentation that the first woman that uh, washed Jesus's feet with her tears so um she's you know she's washing his feet and listen to what they he was having dinner i guess at the pharisee okay let's pick it up in uh, luke 7 verse 36 he says one of the pharisees asked him to eat with him and he went into the pharisee's house and sat down to eat and behold the woman in the city that's where they translated that she was a prostitute who was a sinner when she knew that jesus was at the table um, in the Pharisee's house, brought her brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now, if you've seen the chosen this season, season four, they mix up these two stories, which about sent me to the moon. But I'm I'm, I'm okay. I forgave him. Um, they stood and stood at his feet um, behind him, weeping, and she began to wash her feet with the tears and then wiped them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And then the Pharisees who had, um, invited him saw this and spoke to him saying, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is, who is touching him for she is a sinner. So that word again right there was translated possibly in your Bible as prostitute. There's no proof of that. Remember that divorced women in that culture could not be touched. Okay. Um, and Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other one 50. When they had nothing which to repay, he fr freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one would he love more? And Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. He said, the one you have rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the, the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, which is uh, uh, culturally correct when you walk into someone's house in Israel. And they do this in Italy, too. They kiss you on both sides of your cheek. Um, but she has not ceased 
to kiss my feet since the time I, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to her, her sins, which were many, are forgiven, and now she is loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the, uh, the same loves. And so he goes on. So this whole thing with the feet, we need to look at it anthropology-wise and look at it as, wow, 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 wow. And that culture, when you did not honor somebody's head because they were in the sun all the time, when you did not give them water to wash their head, their hands, their feet, their and oil to moisturize them with, it was considered very, very, very rude. Um, so the fact that Naomi did this for Boaz was a big, big big deal it doesn't mean that they want they wanted to have sex what it was was not prostrating herself to him but honoring him let me say it that way it was honoring him saying i will go wherever you go if you want me okay that's what this gal in uh luke was doing i will i will serve you as lord and savior that's what that's what was happening here Okay, so um, let's pick it up in John 12, the anointing at uh, Bethany. John 12. So two different women did this for Jesus, which you now know, you can see the cultural anthropological um, thread here. Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, to whom he had raised from the dead, there were, uh, they had made him a supper. Him was capitalized there, so they're talking about Jesus. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound, a very costly spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the oils. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, um, Simon's son, who betrayed him, said, why it was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This is, this he said, uh, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had, the, mo the money box and he used it to take out what was put in but jesus said to him let her alone she has kept this for the day of my burial for the poor you will always have with you always but me you will not always have now that's an oxymoron statement because jesus said i will never leave you or forsake you but in this instance he was talking about that he would be gone for three days and three nights. Do you understand that statement? So you have a very, very poor woman washing Jesus with perfume and oil and wiping the uh, feet with her tears and her hair. And then you have Lazarus and Mary and Martha. They were very well off, very well off. And here you have uh mary doing the same thing so those are your bookends that it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor jesus doesn't look at us any differently than he does we're all the same to him we're we're one body of christ regardless of your economic standing the color of your skin the your gender it for him it doesn't matter he paid for it all he paid for it all so this is a very very significant when i was teaching you a few weeks ago about when we look at things in scripture we have to look at it from a 360 view anthropology anthropological you have to look at what was the culture what was actually being said go deeper than you know what was the significance of spike nard what all of this stuff that was going on in that day that we don't think about today because it's not even in our wheelhouse we just read the bible that's a neat story well it's not just a neat story he lived this 
And the, the, the truth is, is he, we're to be in him and experience the things that he, ever, that he experienced. What do you think it felt like for him to have those women do that for him in a culture when a woman was not to touch a man unless they were married? Think about that. He broke every law of Moses. He broke every regulation of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. He broke every marital law. He broke, now it doesn't say these women were married, but the first one was clearly a sinner. Who knows what her sin was? It doesn't say. Everybody just uh, ascribes prostitute to her, but he didn't even call the woman that was caught in the act of adultery a prostitute. He didn't even call the woman that was married five times to living with a man at the well in John 3. He didn't call her a prostitute. So why um, modern day translators or theologians want to call her a prostitute? I, I don't know that. I can't answer for them. But there's nothing that I can find that describes her as a prostitute. But still, given all of that, given all of that, it was illegal for them to touch her. Illegal for them to touch, to, for her, for any of those. And even in Boaz's time, she shouldn't have done that. She broke the law to honor him. And Jesus broke the law to honor us. So this whole thing that women cannot be in ministry, the women, first woman evangelist at the will, the women were the first ones at the tomb. The women were the first ones to go out and tell everybody that Jesus rose again, on and on and on again. That, that whole thing is a picture of what the Pharisees and the Sadducees, how they separated men and women, just like how I explained to you that they separated spirit, soul, and body. We cannot be separated. If that, if that truth holds true, then how, if a man and a woman get married, the two shall become one. If women are a lower class, you can't be one with somebody that you're a lower class then. That's powerful stuff right there. I didn't even plan on saying that. So um, you guys can unmute and um, just I'll take a minute to take a breath. I hope that you got something out of tonight. And um, don't ask me for the notes because this was straight out of the word. I have no notes. My notebook is empty. See? <laughs> You're going to get empty pages. So there you go. Kelly, what do you think? I think that I've been finding a lot of bookends. Remember me telling you about the bookend with, um, I'm in the book of John. And um, the other day I was reading about uh, where Peter denies Jesus three times. And then when I read it in the Passion Translation, it referred to when Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And it actually connected those together. And I was like, a bookend, I found it without any prompting. So <laughs> I was very excited about that. So That's awesome. I'm seeing more and more and more. So this was awesome. It was great. Good, good. Doc, what do you say? Oh, uh, that was very awesome. I was very interested in uh, hearing more about it, but uh, we only have a certain amount of time, but I'd like to hear a uh, second part to it for next week. But um, yeah, the bookends are just, uh, I love it. I love the bookends. And I, uh, you really enlightened me on a lot of different things here that's connected into a couple of other avenues. Uh, my light went out um, of where you were heading with it, with, especially in the nature of where women are not supposed to preach uh, you hear this all the time but like i gave a message today just ironically uh in the same sense there 
and I challenged people on it. I didn't say this or that or the other thing, but I put it up in there and then I came at the end is like, here's the bookend. Now you tell me, what did God intend for women to be? And we're equally, we're, we're, we're equal. So yeah, I enjoyed the part. Uh, I can't get at what I'm trying to say, but at the moment in, in, in a short term here, but the, um, the bookends with everything that ties up to that last part where you're talking about evangelism and women were there. Women were talking about the Lord. We were women. Were, if you're evangelizing, you're preaching. <laughs> I, I believe. Mm -hmm. you know, right? And uh, so, the women supported his ministry. Is, is that right? In the new Testament, the women. Amen. <clears throat> so, and traveled amen. with him. Amen. But I really enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, like here another look because you, you know, like you were mentioning, you don't have time to uh, tonight to go into other things. But uh, we, we, I wouldn't mind hearing it again a little bit more in the depth of uh, some more of where you were heading with things. Well, uh, every single one of their names are very, very powerful, and uh, what it all means in the Hebrew, and it's, it's just it's amazing. It's amazing. And uh, the Passion Translation does have the Book of Ruth. It's a three three there's three and one on the passion but all right. and he put a lot of footnotes in there all right because so. i'm gonna look into those uh on amazon probably uh probably a couple of weeks i'm gonna order them yeah. uh, if there was five books in the I old testament so. i think that's oh. what uh i caught from you on the um on whatsapp yeah. yeah i really enjoyed it thank you again pastor tommy do you have anything you want to share no, I really enjoyed it, Dr. Ed, and um, it, it just increased my faith. Um, it made me realize that um, things insignificant, well, what I thought was insignificant, like age or someone's name or or their uh, the time of day, how significant it is. And um, one thing I never thought of is um, when you said that uh, Jesus uh, did not speak Greek, I never thought that the New Testament is in Greek, but the translation could possibly be off because Jesus did not speak in uh, in Greek. So, I mean, that that's deep. I really appreciate you. You know, I hope you feel better, too, by the way. You Thank know, you. I, understand, I caught the tail end of, of your eyes, so I'm, I'm praying that God will multiply all your blessings. And, Thank you. Um, just, just be healed in Jesus' name. That, that's all I have. Amen. Amen. Does anybody else, Joe? Do you want to share anything? Um, nothing exactly specifically. It was, it was deep. Um, it was a lot to think about, a lot to connect. Um, my mind was kind of going all over the place trying to, um, process it all. But it was good. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Does anybody else have anything they want to add in? Cynthia, Carol, anybody? Before we hang up, yeah, um, the significance of the feet really can't be overemphasized because feet represent how you walk in life. So it represents your nature and character because it represents the inner character coming out in what you do, what you say, how you say it. And, you know, Jesus's feet being anointed with oil, you know, Jesus was the anointed. He was the one with the anointed feet. He hmm. walked out perfectly. He was sinless, not just sinless in action, but sinless in heart. Yeah. And in nature and character and in word and in deed. And so, um, you know, the connection between um, Ruth laying at his feet, you know, she was offering herself, her whole being to him and his whole being represented in, in his feet was representative of all of who he was. and. Um, you know, apart from the Holy Spirit anointing Jesus, you know, he couldn't he couldn't even have accomplished his mission 
it had to be by the power of the Holy Spirit and not the power of the flesh. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and now we are the feet of Jesus. We're yeah. to be the feet of Jesus. We're to walk just as he walked. We're to be anointed just like he is anointed because we're one with him. We're one spirit with him. So, you know, the the symbolic symbology of the feet, of the bride, of the anointing. I mean, the redeemer, like you say, the, the yeah, the kinsman redeemer is just so incredibly deep and rich. And like you say, there's just endless layers of revelation that, you know, we're just scratching the surface. But um, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Dr. Edna. You're welcome. Something to think about. Naomi told Ruth, go uncover his feet. So she goes, she uncovers his feet, she lays at his feet. That thread runs through um, to multiple places in the New Testament. When they brought the woman that was caught in adultery out, they tossed her at Jesus' her feet. feet. When Martha got upset with Mary, Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Uh, right. there, there are other accounts. Um, I think it's uh, uh, the father of the, the son that was ravaged by the demons. He went and bowed at Jesus' feet. So the... And, and I'm sure that there's more, but that's just off at the top of my head. But that significance of that cultural significance that you brought out in the anthropological aspect of it, of being at his feet is repeated again and again and again throughout the New Testament. And I didn't put all that together until we started having this discussion tonight. And then it's like, bing, oh, yeah, there is. Oh, wait a second. And there's a. Hey, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I mean. It's she, like once the door opens. Just to speak, she, she. Yeah. Instant after instance after instance. Once you that see it, you can't unsee it. And then it all just starts tumbling into place and. The, just things start getting unlocked and it becomes so exciting, you know, so exciting. All yeah, right, you, you guys. Know, when you, you Go ahead. Tell, tell somebody something one time, you know, it can be important. But when you, you, you have that same thing said again and again and again, there is a much bigger meaning, I think, in this than we're really taking away from it at this point. Yes. I agree with that. I agree with that. And I hope everybody like really thinks about it this week. And, and that, like Martin said, oh, then this pile, just things to unlock on the inside of you where scripture is coming alive. And you can imagine yourself, uh, you know, sitting at his feet and, and looking into his eyes and, just you know there's galaxies in there it's it, it, he finished it all this thing about when naomi told ruth he won't quit till he finishes it all mm. jesus did the same thing the the power mm. behind all these statements um it, i think it's just power it's it's beautiful it's just beautiful so yeah. that was Another thing about the feet, Anna, is the feet represent authority. You know, the the feet, how a person walks is, do they walk in authority? Is the enemy under our feet? Um, and of course, Jesus being Lord is Lord of all. He has all authority. And so our sitting at his feet is acknowledging his lordship and his the that he is worthy of that authority and that the you know and the enemy will be a footstool under his feet and mm. go right to genesis you know he will crush the head of 
with his own feet. And and when you just right. get the thread all the way through from Genesis to Revelation, it, it's powerful. He was pierced in his feet. And and people that that are lame and cannot walk, they're considered invalid and beggars and and you know they they, they can't move about. They're not free. But our free feet yeah. cause us to be free. And he was pierced in his feet so we could be free. So there is a lot to talk about this week, you guys. I will mm -hmm. see you next week. Oh, good, Doc. Did you have something and, else? And when I was listening over here, it's uh, every now, every knee shall bow before me. And as you bow, you're, you're bowing your head. To the feet. At his feet. Yeah. Every mm. knee shall <laughs> will bend and you will bow, you know? Yeah, so it's it's a, everybody's going to yeah. be. Yeah, if you don't and think you're important, you stub your toe. <laughs> 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 Everything hurts Ooh. when you stub your toe. You know you're alive when you stub your toe. Yeah, <laughs> especially that little one. Oh, my God. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. Yes. All right, you guys. Good night. God bless you all. <laughs> God bless you.